are the origin are really sacred yes are like um, they are not just something that is <laughs> uh, not sacred so in that uh, way like you say they have a ritual always yes it's a ritual there and that is considered an architectonic organization you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then it's like this comes this cosmic power that acts and exists into the raga yes and comes down sometimes but just that just happens when you have the ritual but that ritual i mean first how do you define that ritual i mean how do you experience a ritual i mean yeah. i i understand that a ritual have to be done always with someone with a certain level, yes, of knowledge, awakening, maybe purify being, I don't know, you have certain elements, like you say, maybe fire, you know, in the center or water, yeah. or I don't know. And it's always the ritual sometimes involves, in this case, you say ragas, yes, are the mean thing, but maybe are also the ragas involve a, how do you say, a dance movement with the mm. body, yes, mm -hmm. and, or maybe a, another kind of uh, sound, sound, yes, with the voice, uh, voice, sound, poetry, reading, mm -hmm. uh, so this depends of the family or or the people that are doing the ragas or the ritual. I mean, it's also a different kind of ways to do it, or it's just one way. Mm. Uh, I don't know if. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this this is a great again very very important question to avoid um, to avoid you know me sounding like i'm essentializing things i'm speaking from my experience with my gurus but you're exactly right is that um that that from household to household and from you know from lineage to lineage things change and they they change drastically too so i think this is a good example of there's no centralized um or orthodox uh, maybe I would say there's no centralized or orthodox way of 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 saying this is only what it is. It's this and this and this and this. And so when I spent time in India, I did know a lot of uh, amazing musicians that I would go and sit with. And yes, they they all approached the ragi music tradition slightly differently. They shared certain aspects absolutely. There was generally a spirituality, um, but not always. Um, there was, um, sometimes a religious element as well, meaning like, okay. you know, on Saraswati Puja, musicians would, uh, would pay thanks and, and do a, a ritual to Saraswati. Um, and there would be concerts. Like, um, I, I have very fond memories of going to Saraswati, uh, uh Puja concerts in, in, you know, maestros homes. And that was their way of kind of um you know paying their respects and and doing a ritual for the 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 goddess of of knowledge and learning and music music as well um and so i think you can look at it like there's there's going to be a cultural consistency that is somewhat shared but again it's this music is hybrid too religiously speaking it's it's coming from hindu and muslim roots and the music the drupad music that, that i said was at the root of of north indian music is really from the the mogul court um when the moguls this, this music was baby. kind of a mix between what was indian music and um per you know middle eastern and persian uh, music influences there was a lot of okay. um there was a lot of invention there was a lot of um uh, of new things that i think it, that were happening and um but again there's 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 this kind of religious hybridity that's happening the beautiful beautiful thing that i found is that sometimes i would be in the homes of uh, muslim musicians for instance people that I would identify as being muslim but they're singing about krishna and vice versa i okay. you know my 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 guru um my guru's guru 
Prashun Bandupadhai. He has a beautiful bandish. I remember sing, learning in Bhairav and singing about Allah. And I was like, isn't that interesting? Because well, that's not his religion, but it's it's his guru was actually a, a, a Bedi Gumalai Kansab, who's that's he was a Muslim. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of these musicians they might have they had traditional roots, traditional groundings to their the religion, but they were also universal. They were kind of universalizing spirituality in a sense by go, going beyond the kind of the differences in the name and saying, you know what, it's not about if you're singing about Krishna or Allah. It's th- it's it's maybe about other things like if you're surrendering to some something greater than yourself, or if you're singing and pursuing music. Um, for for the betterment of you and and your community and and whatnot but um yeah it's like uh sorry it's like they go beyond the form i mean i mean yeah, it's yeah. not about the form like they're telling yes it's not like you have to dress in that way yes you have to eat these things specifically when you do ragas no so it's not formatory. Yeah. It's like a more like open. Yeah. 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 I, I think so. And I think that there are certain etiquettes um, that are, I mean, that are very much um, shared. Like, yeah, like dressing in Indian dress, for instance, like um, I'm in a, a, even in a kurta, for instance, but a, to go to an Indian concert, I would always wear Indian dress. And that is important. Yeah, that, so that, is- that, that was important to me. Um, Okay. Not not all Westerners do that. Not all Indian people do that either. <laughs> okay. But to perform on stage, I think you know people are always in Indian formal, like um, are in in proper formal Indian dress, and so there is a shared etiquette um about certain things, which you could say is part of the ritual in a social sense. If they don't have this form, yes, how they the ragas it and lost. Didn't lost. I mean, it's 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 amazing, you know. It's like right, yeah. Well, and it, it's fascinating because in terms of um, jazz music, it's evolved relatively quickly. I mean, jazz, you know, bebop. Uh, you have big band music. You have New Orleans music and big band music, and and then um, and then bebop music, forties and fifties, and then mm-hmm. you have free jazz. And like every decade, things are moving and changing drastically. You know, Miles Davis is a really famous example of a jazz musician that almost every ten years on the <laughs> on the turn of the decade, he would radically change what he was doing, um, and he was successful at it. Um, and Indian music evolves very uh, a lot more slowly. Now, what's interesting about what you say is, yes, the oral tradition is that you are going to you're going to sit with your guru and you're going to learn these structures, these um, these what the ragas, not only structures, but like the the ritual structures, let's say, in a in a larger sense. And you're going to internalize those. And a lot of the times in the tradition, I, I, the way that I would also answer your question earlier is that, you know, I had to go and really. Um, trust my guru unconditionally, surrender to my guru unconditionally, and and really say, I if I want to, exp- if my goal is to experience something like what you are experiencing, it will never be the same, but something like this. If I want to experience and play a raga, I will have to learn what you do. So there is a, a sense of I will accept your raga ritual and learn it intricately, internalize it. And in a way that I would see that is that it's like you're, you're going to somebody else that you trust, that you love the way they sing or play. They, it transforms you when you listen to them. So that's how that's how I ended up feeling when I was listening to my Guruji's music. And so I would I sat for years and years, not really questioning, saying, how do I want to play this raga? Because I didn't have the say at that time. I didn't really feel like I had any idea about how to make a raga happen. So I really had to unconditionally accept and and surrender to the guru, which is a hard thing. I mean, I think to the Western mind, maybe, or to the modern mind, surrendering um, to, to, I mean, you're surrendering to a tradition, you're surrendering to somebody else or a guru. It's is, like, is, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this was this was something that felt natural for me, and okay. uh, it w- it wasn't about losing your own individuality, or, or I mean, like it wasn't about um, losing your own voice or your own 
it was more about just opening to somebody else's and really becoming that as much as you could. And so the way I would describe it is that you you kind of, my guru helped me build these structures, whether they were internal disciplinary, I mean, sorry, not disciplinary, but it, in, internal structures of being disciplined, practicing a certain kind of way, concentrating the mind a certain way, sitting with the rag a certain way, tuning the instrument a certain way, sitting a certain way. Uh, wow. All of these things... Yeah, all of these things were part of the training, um, and and I accepted that. But also, it's not just accept it and then repeat it as if now you've gotten. It's sort of like you have to do it yourself at a certain point. It's like, right. So you have you 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 learn how to to build this very elaborate kind of ritual space, um, and then you have to figure out okay, how does this work for me? Because I'm a different, and especially as a Westerner, I'm not the same as my guru. Nobody. Everybody has a uniqueness in their place and time and their their disposition and their capacities and their 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 you know their aspiration. So then it, after a certain point of time, it was almost like I had to build these structures on my own. And are they yes. similar? Yeah. How and do you find them? It's like, wow, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So and that's the continuity from from uh from uh generation to generation so there is there is parts of that structure that are very much part of my guru now i have a couple gurus which makes it interesting because i have a couple different ritual structures at play so like between my gurus there's a lot of similarity but there are differences because that one plays an instrument one sings for instance that's a big difference um but at the same time there's there's shared structures there's different types of structures like like the the, the vocal style the instrumental style is going to be those are different kind of structures of arranging the raga of organizing the material um and um the different aesthetics that go into it but now that i have these again these kind of two different places that i've deepened now they can kind of they they are they're mixing together they're flowing together in a way that i'm finding well this is where i am i'm very much a part of both of these people's uh training and their lives and their their sadhana and so i think that 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 it's it's not about it's not about now for like forgetting what they taught me or whatever or you know like saying well no no i'm now i'm my own maestro you know like absolutely not it's more like continuing to deepen your these two these these this relationship with both of these people and and the 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 talim they gave me the training they gave me but also finding what is emerging out of that space you know out of that space of me <laughs> so i think that's the interesting part that as an artist goes on and and deepens their relationship over the course of years and decades then something will emerge that is just different you know um and that's okay and i think that in raga music that's part of the tradition as well it just generally moves a lot more slowly um so the structures that you inherit from your guru for instance are held more literally for longer i think whereas in the jazz tradition i think it's, there's not as much you know, there's not as much emphasis on you know maintaining a, tri uh, a, a lineage for instance a garana it's called in the north of india it's more like you you are influenced by musicians that you love that move you and you find <laughs> what it does to you and you kind of interpret things and you find your own way of doing things a lot sooner you know so yeah so <laughs> i i i think that you already have your roots in the ragas yes uh was like 10 years maybe 11 years take you to mm -hmm. build that root roots and now you are in that state of process or maybe you already passed the of uh creating your own your own self uh, you are like this raga musician that stand by himself already, but do you do you know what is this raga musician? I mean, who is my Jonathan K? You many times tell to me, who are you? Uh, but yeah, like if you stand there, like in front of this, with this phenomenology with this ritual space, with this Zelius uh, philosopher, with this yeah. PhD that you are doing, yeah. all these things, you know, that you are building with the jazz that is 
deep, deep more in your roots. Yes. Who are you now? Yes. Who, what is, what does Jonathan K want to offer with these ragas? And where is the um, manifestation of your soul? Which part of your soul is manifesting through this? I mean, did you discover? To discover which part of you is manifesting? Yes. Or mm. Well, I think I think that 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 emergent, that kind of I use that word auto poet poet poetic, sorry, auto poetic emergence kind of is really what I'm trying to open to, really. I'm I mean, I I could again use my mind and organize eastern ideas or raga ideas with western ideas and compose music that can put them in relation and i've done that a lot too and that's an important process to me but right now i'm i'm interested in the experimental aspect which is really not as much about um not as much about creating anything from like the mind or from like myself but more opening to how these musics are are really cosmic in a way to me how they can open to what's beyond me and so a lot of my practices um whether in raga music or in improvised jazz music it, it the root or something that's common is that i approach both of them in a contemplative way and that that means that like an actively contemplative way you know so mm -hmm. i think that it's more like the the practices that i've done throughout my my um starting with being in india and practicing integral yoga but meditation for instance was an important part of my life for the, all those years and i feel like that that's that was really opening that was really uh, a way of me settling myself finding a kind of equanimity in the being and opening to something that's beyond you know and so that's how i would approach um this kind of the confluence of all the things that that make up who i am i guess in a way or all the things that i've engaged in in my life in my mandala of becoming so musically speaking who who am i i i don't know what it's going to sound like <laughs> but i do know that i can open to this tradition that i that i've i've practiced and i've i have a Uh, a daily relationship with called raga music and also open to the forces of improvised music and see what happens so the sound is not something that i really am um at this point i'm not trying to design a sound i'm not trying to um to uh i'm trying to allow it to work on me and part of that experiment means that i'm not sure of the results which is really the definition of experimentation you know So that's where this this approach that I'm at now is more of uh, the experimental. Um, but I still feel that it's important to to acknowledge like that 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 each tradition, like jazz music, raga music, for instance, I still cultivate them traditionally speaking. Raga music, I still and I still perform um, that. That's important to me. Is that I I'm not losing touch with. The container, that specific container, that specific ritual, um, for instance, that's something that I'm still very actively working on. Um, and same with with you know experimental jazz. I'm undergoing a lot of new experiments, new influences, um, and trying to trying to find some kind of uh, kind of fertile space that that music can engage with the raga music, but. I think that no matter what an artist is doing, there's going to be there's going to be structures of practice. There's going to be structures of of discipline that go into like you know deepening and, in, and internalizing um, certain certain approaches to the to the art form. You know, so that's very important to me. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that you share with us. It's uh, very intimate for you to say, and uh, also, well, I was uh, wonder. <laughs> I mean, you. Every time that more people see you in a concert, playing the ragas, maybe in Canada or in another country, you en engage with many, many people. Yes, women, men, different kind of diversity. Yeah. 
how mm -hmm. did you relate with that? I mean, it's like you become like famous, yes? Like, I mean, it's this kind of energy that you, that musicians have, yes? And I see that you have a lot of listeners, a lot of followers. So how do you relate with that? And it's like, wow, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of energy uh, that you are receiving. And uh, do you transform in some way? Do you the, give, uh, have gratitude to, to some force? Or do you know that is like all this is a play? And I mean, you make your efforts, but also it's, I don't know how to tell the this. It's because you were surrendered, yes? When you surrender, you have to enter in this dimension of, of the mm. kindness that someone else gives you. The influence over many, many, many people, yes? Because you have influence of, like I can say, you, can, yeah. you have this deep influence. So that you don't use in a bad way, you just you said for transfer certain knowledge that was given to you. I mean that's that's an interesting question. I've never thought too much about it in terms of um how to frame the question or how to frame my answer here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't I mean I I don't think okay, maybe I'll I'll answer it this way is that when I did move to India um, and I started learning raga music with my brother and our good friend, Justin Gray, who was um, a bass player and my brother's a saxophone player. And we took some lessons and we were also traveling around India and we were able, we stayed at a lot of ashrams and temples and that's where we performed. Um, we offered music there. It wasn't a performance as much as an offering as a meditation offering. And I remember that my, my guru, uh, Shantanuji, um, and, and his mother, um, organized us to stay at the Sri Aurobindo, um, ashram in Delhi. And this was the first kind of ashram we had stayed at. And we did a music offering. Now we were Western musicians already, and we were young professionals. We were out of school. I was anyway, my brother and Justin, I think were just finished school, but we were trying to become professional. I was five years into that. Um, so I guess in terms of like the idea of having influence in a way that you can make a living, for instance, like how can I, how, you know, how can I play music and make enough money that I can make a living is the, that's the, those are professional goals. Now I found that after a certain amount of time pursuing those goals, it, it kind of felt like, well, this, this can go on indefinitely. But I needed to be, I wanted to be a student again. I, I didn't have time to practice. I didn't have time to go within and cultivate myself. It was more like the skills I developed in school were really now being put to use. And I was doing gigs. I was playing jazz. I was playing Latin music or uh, rock and roll or funk music. And mm -hmm. I, I loved all those experiences. But I really had a calling to kind of for like more for self transformation, self exceeding. Um, it was, it was not as much about trying to become a professional. And so that's what I realized when I was in India anyway. And so India provided that opportunity for me to kind of go back into learning. And, and, and this was also um, part of that aspiration to, to become a student again was to become sort of um, a student of spirituality. I, I, I felt that was something I, uh, I needed to address in my life. And um, anyway, so we were at the Delhi Ashram and we played for the music, uh, the, the meditation. And we, there was a stage that we sat on, but everybody was facing the altar uh, of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And we were kind of off to the side and we played uh, 40 minutes of, of ragas to so the best of our ability, definitely not um, professional standard ragas, but in a temple, it's not about being a professional. It's about offering. It's about surrendering. To the divine it's about you know uh leaving your ego at the door and this is not this is not for your own ego or for your own 
um, you know, you know, fame or gain in any way. And that was a really uh, profound experience for me because we played music to a very receptive room of people because they were mm -hmm. all sitting in contemplation. We had started by sitting in contemplation, meditation, and we played music. And when we finished, everybody got up and then bowed to the altar <laughs> and then left. And we went for dinner. I mean, in the, in the ashrams, there is no applause. There is no, there is none okay. of the, because it wasn't about, oh, the music was so great, or you're such a great artist, or there, none of that. It was really a beautiful experience. And it was very opposite to being a professional musician, which is, you know, you're the center stage and you, you know, you are getting the applause and you take the applause, you know, or it can go to your head or, or whatnot, you know, but I really found that to be um, the spark of something that was very profound in my life. And so over the years of being in India, my Guruji arranged many concerts um, at, during my travels. I would travel with him at many Sri Aurobindo centers, actually, okay. all over Bengal. Yeah. And th it was always the best place to play music to people that were that were just completely open, you know, to, to what was being offered. Mm -hmm. And I guess the shared aspect was really surrender, aspiration, and kind of opening to the grace of the divine. And that's really what... Um, the sadhana of music to me is about and so i guess you know in terms of how i relate to to the, the the music and when you know when i do a concert that's really my spirit and i think that that's that's what i try to foreground whether it's in a professional setting or not <laughs> at this point because i do professional concerts too um but i think that that gave me an experience and also normalize that experience of that that the goals of what you're doing here are not limited to just being a professional. And so in one way, I actually feel like being an amateur is actually much more important to me than being a professional. Because to to be an amateur means like to go back to the the origin of the word is to love what mm -hmm. you do, right? And to me, that's what I realize. And I've I've met a lot of professionals that don't necessarily love with their their whole being what they what they are doing. It's more like, well, I I'm doing this because it's my job, you know. And yeah. so, if if I can't uh, I, I you know if I can't do a concert and feel that I love absolutely love this and this these these people and this arrangement this situation, then and you know, then it's hard for me to do that. It's, it does. I, I would say no in a way to opportunities that I can't relate to as an amateur, as a lover of what I'm doing. And so this is, I think, just a differentiation that I think is important to make because this is it's it's not it's not limited. Like my experience of music would be not limited to that scope of like being a professional fitting into uh an industry if you will like being a a replaceable cog in the industry of music for instance is not yeah coming a, a very um relevant question culturally speaking you know like that question is is definitely um it's it's becoming i think important to discuss for sure and yes there's you know if you think about the jazz tradition a lot of the early jazz musicians led very um self-destructive lifestyles mm -hmm. um and were addicted to hard drugs um and you know the music they created was from those states in a way um and it's hard not to think well is it what what's making this music have that kind of infinite spark or that potential what what makes this music really stand out in time exactly. you know makes it timeless and you know i don't think that limiting it to a drug is really the right way so it's not you know that logic would say well then i must if i want to be as inspired and and as as uh charlie parker for instance well then go and do heroin like that no way <laughs> you know <laughs> there's got to be um there's got to be other ways and so you know, John Coltrane was a good example of somebody who 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 um, hit a, that dead end, um, and that that tra like he 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 um, sobered up on his own terms, and and emerged again. He had a spiritual awakening as he was sobering up, and then he came out um, after a couple months of of that, and his career after that, which um, that happened in 
um, 65, I believe. So I'm forgetting the year of that. Um, I could look that up uh, of when he sobered up. But from from about 65 onwards, he wrote he in 1960, 64, actually, sorry, he wrote an album called A Love Supreme, which was really his he he had a spiritual awakening and things became about the cosmic and about the, the divine level you know the universal aspects of of and the powers of music and so i was very in, influenced by that one of my saxophone mentors pat la barbara who was around the jazz scene um in the, the 60s and 70s and um was around a lot of you know a lot of uh this kind of um this kind of uh culture in a way but he but he was very he he was very much saying well how this is how can how can this be a a sustainable and how can the music help cl cleanse rather you know exactly. and so in, he he chose not to, to to go down that route uh he did yoga actually like Sonny Rollins another famous okay. musician um who also had to clean up uh himself um from hard drugs but he he started doing yoga at his time so there was this looking to eastern knowledge which is again embedded in some of the questions of my life you know continuing on the thread from some of these people but pat la barber for instance actually you know he 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 benefited from the the eastern wisdom traditions and you know yoga helped him um you know purify cleanse his body and and also be able to play you know kind of generate energy and he worked on the breath and so as a student i was really um uh, in, influenced by pat and and i've always just found that trying to look to um more more music in itself as a way of finding altered states like i said i've had certain kinds of transpersonal or alt states of altered consciousness that music has induced and that's what really fueled my fueled my my search in a way it wasn't uh, induced from an external um substance in a way it was induced from a musical experience itself and so that was very that's very uh that's part of my journey but in in raga music i really would say that 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 finding that kind of liminal kind of um limit condition between the habitual and the the supranormal in a way or altered state i think that the raga music did that to me it, it was naturally i mean the music was so powerful uh and especially coming from my gurus the, there was a power in that that i was open to and there are many experiences that uh after receiving training or going and accompanying them um i really found that i was in some kind of a a, a different place it wasn't my normal place and 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 that was really that that really helped me see well the power of music in itself can take you to the these these cosmic places um so that's that's been my my journey you know Wow, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> thank you. It's uh, amazing and thank you for tell us to share with us again. Uh, with us because, again. Uh, because, yeah, we have a lot of musicians that die, <laughs> like you say, with yeah. this kind of, uh, na they be naive, yes, and they been consumed by the system, actually, yeah. yes. So they didn't have the opportunity to approach to, uh, more deep work yes and yoga and mm -hmm. that was then pat and i am very sorry for them because i like it so many of them yes <laughs> that that we lost yes yes and yes, yes. but I, I always have this um question and intrigue in myself because i say oh maybe i am speaking with a musician or with an artist or oh, for sure they are doing something just using so many years. Yes, because it's the most popular, I mean, it's very common, no? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I say it's the open, it's the open mind. But for me to be open mind doesn't mean, uh, maybe for you also, it doesn't mean to accept everything and to, to take everything and put it in your body, yes? That is not open yeah, mind, yeah. actually. And I, I think that the the influence of culture uh and and communities, uh friends, I mean, um popular culture, it's the influence is I think much more deep than we really know and we really uh assume. 
So yeah, I think that you're right. There, there is a lot of, there's a lot of people that might just go along with, with the idea when maybe their body or their, their, their being in isn't calling for it, you know? Um, and so that's where, it, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, these types of substances can be, can maybe, maybe they're calling certain people and saying, this is like an ay ayahuasca, uh, ritual, for instance, maybe somebody's really mm -hmm. open and really listening to themselves and that's, what's calling them. Um, that's that that's definitely would be true for some people and but it's also become like the ayahuasca um shaman journey you know from south america it's become a big tourist industry now and like <laughs> we're seeing we're seeing how destructive it is and and at, it's sort of becoming normalized into certain um certain communities um you know especially in the in north america united states anyway and and canada but you know how 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 is this calling people as opposed to how is the industry and the the force of the industry and how that industry is played out through those the those those communities those groups the culture of those groups how is it just accepted as the in thing or the the thing that the hip thing to do or you know so i i think that that's just a good mm -hmm. example of something that completely unsustainable is destroying these countries in south america for sure the in the tourist industry and i i don't think that you know it's really uh <laughs> doing yes, so from something very sacred yes for a community from a in native indian american uh from a native from a indian in yeah. south america i mean something that have really a ritual something that have a, a tradition that yeah, is coming guess, from like, the past like the, you said. the question of integration okay. is also it it is being addressed you know by certain people certain um scholars or certain practitioners but i think that's still a big question mark and i guess you know for 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 me i think that's that's it, it is important to consider like how how an experience how is it that you're working with the conditions of that experience on a regular basis to integrate it and so something like or like for me anyway the ritual of raga for instance is something that i can work with on a regular basis um and and kind of like it 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 yeah it's just that's that's how i feel like i need to like my my body my soul my mind is is calling for something that i can kind of cultivate on a on a daily basis on a on a even a moment to moment basis like the idea that these these ragas like are part of my body they make up my body the music in itself is is something that that's that's kind of composing me as I try to understand how to compose it, you know. And I think that I'm looking for, you know, and this goes right to the core of Sri Aurobindo and um, even your question um, more specifically. But all life is yoga, and so part of my engagement with the West and Western thought uh, and the traditions of art and aesthetics, for instance, I at a certain point started thinking well all life is yoga yes i that's 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 a goal that i have and i think there's a valid goal to have you know to to kind of like at every moment not just choice moments not just sitting in meditation and being blissed out and then getting up and being completely at the whim of whatever emotions you you know may take you <laughs> off off the chart um or um or whatnot but i think that all life is art and that idea of art needs to then be dealt with. What do you mean by art? You know, and you could say in a different way, you know, all life is aesthetic. And again, it's like, well, okay, what does that word mean? What's the, <laughs> what is what is the history of that word? But also, how can we reimagine that word in a way? And that's really where Deleuze and Guattari come in, because that's that's really embedded in some of their thought and um, I think that would be a uh, that would be one way to look at this horizon is that all life is is yoga, and on the other side, all life is really art or aesthetic in a way. We are in the process of becoming. Uh, there's multiple parts of ourselves. There's multiple parts of our um, assemblage with the environment, with society, with uh, the cosmos, and we can think of those as aesthetic relationships. You know, again, going to Sri Aurobindo all problems of existence are fundamentally problems of harmony. Interesting that he uses the word harmony here, which is very much 
and as a term that could be related to the practicing or the sorry the the practicing of an art form or uh, the concept of aesthetics and so it's sort of like even the most dissonant things can still be conceived of as a certain type of harmony it's not that that you know consonant is good and dissonant is bad that would be that's a strange valuation that we sort of learn and we accept yes but it's more like it's more like expanding the scope and like really that idea that all problems of existence are 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 problems of harmony well what mm -hmm. what's your relationship to this harmony and how can you sit with this harmony as dissonant as it may be or how many harmonies you know like how thick are the would be like you know how how thick are are the the types of harmonies that are coming out in this experience for instance you know um how how you know how many different relationships are there like like almost like polyphony there's many voices at the same time right like you could say like the world is a is a is a polyphony of of individuals a polyphony of different becomings of different um of different sounds even if you will you know you have the nature uh, you have nature sounds you have the birds the insects you have the planes you have the rains you have <laughs> you know what i mean and yes, it's like how, how they they are all part of a, a kind of a, a, a you know if you look at it through a sonic lens is a sonic ontology or sonic metaphysics in which you can sit and say that how i position myself or how i am positioned which each one of these things is really uh, you know, I can I can open myself to an arrangement that can be harmonious. It's just a matter of, you know, a matter of doing that, I guess. <laughs> but I think yes. yoga addresses this question, and and so yeah, I would say that that's that's how can we see ourselves as a as a as a work of art in a way that would be interesting to think about. Um, like somebody else, uh, Bernard Stiegler, another thinker that I, I study, a French thinker, but it, like he's talking about social uh, sculpture, like the idea that our 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 society we can think of as a as a sculpture in a way. What's the aesthetics of that sculpture? You know, that's an interesting way to try to think about well. <laughs> using the model of art to understand culture, for instance. You know, so anyway, these are just some questions that I find interesting. Yeah, there are high to <laughs> very conceptual. Okay, thank you, uh, Jonathan, for today. Uh, maybe we continue with the part of the. If you have time, uh, if you want to perform something for us, uh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Uh, it's going to be